Okay, here we go live. Three, two, one. Welcome to the level design world mapping from paper to Unreal Engine in the spirit of the game jam, level design in a day. We're going to go through some core concepts for creating maps with pencil and paper or pen and ink, uh, gouache, paint, watercolor, whatever you want to use and translating that into a playable map. Uh, the tra tradition of level design, um, especially from the tabletop realm, really comes from um, the grid or a graph paper. So one of the things that is really powerful in Unreal Engine that makes it uh, very useful for mapping is the the grid. So you have a grid snap that's already on. So hopefully these grids show up a little bit on camera, maybe not too well. Um, this paper probably shows up a little bit better. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so what we're going to do is go through um, using basic drawing principles, gesture form, line value pattern, negative, positive shape and silhouette to help you generate new ideas. So uh, a couple of the basic tools here. I have a uh, black lantern four millimeter. Uh, I'll get the Faber-Castell out. I also have uh, Tombow's water-based pens. I'll show you why uh, I like the water-based pens. Um, they let you uh, use some of the water brushes or the uh, you know, pigment-free water brush to actually smear and create a positive negative shape. Uh, I also like the uh, old architectural pencils. Here, that's mostly uh, the graphite tip that you can bring way out and keep nice and sharp with a graphite sharpener and let me get this a little bit uh, farther out here there you go and you can kind of hold that in a more traditional sketching style so you can really kind of fill the space up quickly with that one and then using the little uh, kind of pen style eraser you can kind of take this and you can use your your tip to do negative shape and erase away after you filled in with solid space. So we'll talk about uh, solid uh, space world building as opposed to empty space or a negative space world building. And then to make that a little bit faster, uh, we also have an electric eraser here. So that goes, of course, uh, something that you can really do well on the computer with Photoshop, which we'll get into in the digital aspect of this, which is um, using the eraser as much as you would the positive space or the pencil or the pen to create um, objects in space. A uh, nice fat square eraser. You can still use a uh, smooth shader or nub. Um, I also like to keep a terry towel around or something I can really kind of wipe and smear uh, to create value to designate uh, changes and transitions within the levels. And you want to have, of course, a regular pencil sharpener around. And uh, introducing a couple of more traditional fine arts utensils. This is a Conte pencil. Uh, so this has uh, got some wax in it. And this lets you, uh, of course, I think my cat's going to jump on camera any moment here. In case you uh, see a feline form dash across the screen, that's uh, Nixie. Yeah, there she goes. She wants to get on camera. Hello. And uh, of course, rub against the camera. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Kat. It's so cute. Okay, so with, that's, uh, with that said, let's jump straight into some exercises here. So first thing to do is think of all the different map types you might have inside of the different game types. So with the pencil and paper with the RPG games, right, we had your imagination was your limitation, right? You could come up with a floating space station, an underwater city, hollow world, interplanetary, uh, nano size, whatever you wanted to. And you didn't have to build any of that in the digital sense. Or, um, of course, for the tabletop miniature people, uh, we would build modular sets and, and pour them with dental plaster and you know do all that. But that is a lot more work, I think, uh, for the hobbyist. Uh, but with the pencil and paper, we can make up any map we wanted to. So if you think about the different maps now we have in the digital realm, which is truly extraordinary how many different types of games are in the, in the computer uh, industry for gaming. Um, let's kind of mix those two uh, ideas together. So one of the first things we'd look at, I think, on a video game would be like the mini map or the overhead map. So a mini map would give you kind of a representation of where you're at in the game world. And then you'd also maybe have like a long, like maybe a side view 
uh, scroll map or something like that. And then you'd, uh, if you're doing a tabletop game, you would have usually a top down as well as a side viewer elevation. So let's look at those different types of maps. And I'm gonna start off with a pen. Now, the reason I'm using the pen to start off with <clears throat> is I think same thing when you're doing gesture drawing and field sketches, you should always have a sketchbook. Uh, I really like my GDC gift from Epic a few years ago. They gave us a little Unreal Engine book that had a little graph grids built in it, but some kind of field sketch guide where you can always be drawing, always be sketching out uh, design ideas for levels and game worlds and game mechanics and things like that. So if you use a pen and you're using graph paper, there's no erasing. You're kind of stuck with what you got. And that's really, I think, important for when people are first doing gesture drawing. So uh, for a side view, we could think of, uh, say, a uh, desert, right? some hills, something like this. I'll have to draw bigger for the camera. And within the desert, perhaps maybe there's a partially buried city. Now you can do a breakaway elevation. Let's say there's like a... Uh, terrace pyramid of some sort to where you can see something above the ground and remember I'm doing gestural drawings I'm not doing any kind of precision I'm not worried about it being good or not and then within that maybe you can have different entryways and passageways so we can say from the sands and the sand dunes that have brushed up against this form maybe there's like one entryway so you could kind of block in your doors now for traditional tabletop gaming what I think is really useful is to have a, a legend or a key uh, available to help you reference as you're designing so you could do a legend I'll write a little bigger over here legend or a key and within the legend or key typically what we'd have and you can see is on the tabletop samples that I provided for uh, class you'd have you know the door double door You'd have a one-way door, a false door. You'd have the secret door, passageway. Get that a little bit better, which is usually signified by an S drawn through. And then you have various uh, objects. Uh, there, there'd be like uh, the dais or the raised, you know, altar. There was the statue was typically marked by a um, star within a circle. So marking these passageways and having your walls and passageways kind of helps you guide where the player pathway is going to be. Um, now for both, usually when we're doing these levels in Unreal, I'd like to think of like three primary pathways. All right, so we have one's the primary and two secondary. Excuse my handwriting today, my hand's a little messed up. And then third, we'll do a tertiary error. Now, the primary path would be the main pathway that you would assume the player would follow, right? Kind of the old moniker, you know, here's your main road. Do you take the path uh, less taken or the path, or the more you know, well-worn path, the, you know, the safer path, whatnot? And then, of course, you can always do uh, as many as you want off this, and you can have the uh, secret or hidden or surprise, right, and path as well. Um, but these are some basic rules to get you started. If you haven't done this before, this should be um, pretty helpful. Now, this Tombow I have here, which is nice, but this has a nice hard tip. It also has a brush tip. So if I need to fill space in quickly, I can. So if I'm doing a quick side elevation for a, a level map, uh, if an area is filled in, like, say, these little hills, I'll go ahead and just fill these little sand dunes in here that I was playing around with. And I could just fill them in wholly. And all the way up to uh, the edge of our little ziggurat that's buried in the sand here. Who knows what's buried in those sands over the years, right? They're always finding something new, just like in the rainforests. Right. And I'm recording this on my phone, so I'm not really zooming in and out. Like that. Now, if I'm going to do a entryway here, uh, perhaps uh, there's a village over here, right? And in the village on the other side. Let's do, oh, let's do like some kind of simple rolling hills. Maybe this is closer to the river, or some waterway next to the desert, and you have some buildings here. All right. 
maybe some simple mesa, maybe some brick buildings, things like that. Now maybe somewhere in the building, maybe there's a well, and through that well you can access a secret entryway to this. So we're kind of providing, and I have a graph on here, but I'm not really worried about following the graphs. If I was mapping this for a game, uh, I think in the 70s and 80s when we were doing a lot of the tabletop gaming level world designs, uh, when you're first starting out, maybe I'd rough in and get really precise on the grids, which I would go back and do, but right now I'm just kind of sketching. Um, I remember we're, <clears throat> we're kind of looking at this as, you know, gestural, gestural sketches. So loose, a flowing line can move through this. And so I can go back to the hard end on this and we can say, okay, here's our main door. And then the door goes in, there's a stairway <clears throat> down, <clears throat> excuse me. And kind of filling in the whole space. So a lot of times when we're doing the passage, we'd fill in the the uh, the wall space with the the darker line, and then we kind of leave the rest open. And then maybe this goes into like an open floor, kind of maybe some sort of uh, entryway or sanctum of some sort. Okay, so since this is a side view, in the very first TSR books, and I think seventy two and seventy three, they discussed the level as having a multi level dungeon with uh, different passageways that could circumvent and go around. So maybe there's another room down here like this and another level down here. So, so far I have two entry points. Now, if you're gonna do a key for your level design documentation for your game grid, you should also not just have a legend or key to uh, symbolize where things are in your level, but you can also um, list these. We'll just use a, you know any alphanumeric, so A, B, C, D, E, Right, and so maybe A would be the starting point. So maybe start off in the village, right? And just kind of try and pick some nomenclature or something that would make sense to you and your team, uh, and that is reusable. That kind of becomes your your uh, modus operandi or kind of ways of designing things. And of course, you can always explore different ways, but it's good to have something to fall back on that will always make sense to yourself and other people. And then B right here would be the main entrance if you follow, you know the the desert guide, you know, through uh, to the right particular rock outcropping. Now, with these tombos, they have different values as well. This is the darkest one. This is really black. I also have one here that's a lighter one. So then you can kind of stagger things almost like you would your fake backdrops and your foreground, midground, background, extreme background in film or in different uh, staging techniques. So I could also kind of add in maybe, you know, some mountains in the background that. So I'm just trying to get a sense of place. Um, whenever you're doing a level, think of it as a slice of your gameplay. Think of the level as a having a beginning and an end or some sort of a variety of beginnings and endings. There it goes a little bit darker and you can see now. So maybe you're supposed to go to where, you know, the monolith is aligned, kind of Indiana Jones style. If you go to this particular spot in the in the desert and there's a monolith off in the background mysterious monolith and you align it right with the sunset it shows you the entrance to the right so all sticks right um, all kind of known devices that uh, storytellers and creators have used over the years there we go okay and now we're going to connect these levels together so if you get down here perhaps uh, you can get from this one through a secret chute that goes through down to this level or you can go from this part to here and then here to here right so again we're talking primary path would go from point a to point b and you can i could fill in where you know c d e and f are as i go so b would be, be the main entrance and then i'd go here to c and i'm trying to make sure these show up on camera there we go you can get to D, and then to E, and then perhaps this is F. And the order you put these in is kind of uh, up to you how you're kind of letting your story evolve. Now, for the grid, when I'm doing this loose stuff, I'm not worried yet, but what we're going to get into is we're going to get into the, each of these grids within your key. I should have drawn this over here. At the top of the key, usually we want to have scale defined. So one grid might equal Typically, if this is going to be to uh, build scale, it'd be like five or ten feet. So five or ten feet. 
But if you're doing like a big overland level map like that, you don't have to worry about that just quite yet. But just remember that scale is going to be very important because that's what you're defining when you're first doing this. Um, now this is the first pass of doing this. So once I've, now that we've defined uh, having a legendary key and how you do the side view and how you kind of think about different pathways too, let's look at getting a little bit looser with this. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside for a moment. Grab a, another piece of graph paper here. Okay. And let's explore a little bit. So here's the first exercise people are doing when they're just getting started, whether you're a veteran or you're just learning. Um, if you're coming up with a brand new idea, you want to rough it and sketch it out. So you can use uh, gestural lines, right? So maybe something that kind of flows like this. Gestural line. And is this a pathway? Is this a river? Is this a nebula a galaxy? Is this something that you know, coils through the universe? Does it go up, down, and around? Is this a top view or side view? We don't know yet. I'm just kind of playing around with the grid on here. Now, um, a lot of times when gesture lines evolve, for me at least, uh, they will turn into the pathway more than anything. So once I've done something like that, I might go, okay, back through there and say, uh, I got the sharper tip on here, you guys can see on camera. This is, uh, the architectural pencil is really nice. Um, perhaps this is a, um, in outer space, right? So we have different like orbiting rings of like different space stations along this pathway. And this pathway could be represented in many different ways. This pathway could be like something you see in Star Wars, Star Trek, Guardians of the Galaxy. It could be uh, jump gates. Right, so maybe each of these represents a, a jump gate next to a settlement. So here's the jump gate right there. There's another jump gate. And another one over here. Another jump gate. And then next to each of these jump gates, maybe if I can mark them a little bit differently while I'm going. So I might take this and do like a little icon. And iconography is really important when you're doing this. Just think about something that's uh, clear and legible, makes sense and easy to read. Now, if I was doing this in my sketchbook, I do these, I actually were pretty small. Um, I wouldn't say thumbnail size, but pretty small. And then I'm only doing this on a whole sheet of paper per gesture sketch just to show up on camera a little bit easier. Okay, so there's our little jump gates that we can go through. And maybe if you get to one jump gate, can take you through. And again, you could label these if you want ABC. But if you're just gesturing, I wouldn't start labeling stuff right now. We just want you to come up with uh, 10 is a good number to shoot for, 10 or 20 of these. And they could be, again, top or side. And I'm going to have to get a thicker pencil here. Let's see. We'll try this big old Conte. Ooh. Back. That one. Go back to the brush tip. Here we go. Top. That shows up much better. Right? If I wanted to do a side view of the same idea, um, then I can start thinking of how these things might uh, align in the world so I can kind of uh, flatten it out. Now, you could, if, since you're thinking of outer space, think about uh, what we used to call Z play. Which, is, of course, Z now with the uh, more in the animation and film world, Z was the depth into the screen. But in, uh, when we first started using Unreal Engine, at least when I used it back in 2002, 2003, Z is up and down or the, or the kind of God mode. So Z plays up and down play. On this one, say I had a gate here, maybe that little gate right there. I think for the purpose of the camera, I'm going to just stick with the pen so the pencils are a little bit light. Um, Maybe that now is a really tremendous like shot upward and then back downward again and then forward again over here. And these are more of an up and down motion than they are uh, left, right, or side to side motion. But that's up to you to determine. It's just something to, I think, helps people um, who are still new to this to th not think of a perfectly flat, always thinking top down on your map. The side view uh, or the elevation is really key to getting people to looking up and down in your game, especially if, uh, you know, we're talking about 3D games uh, in particular here. Um, the motion and the rhythm and the pattern of these lines, how you do these, um, filling in the positive and negative space, I can use color with this. 
Let's see with my colored markers here. here we go. Right, so we could have like kind of uh, green or uh, safe areas to travel through, right? And I usually save the color to a little bit later, but I'm gonna jump around here a little bit to get people started. And then perhaps, you know, red would be danger. So when you first start off the game, maybe you have to fly through this nebula ring and it's very dangerous. Maybe there's meteors or a swarm of, uh, you know, comets flying through. Right. Maybe there's another one over here. And you want to watch out for that. Uh, we call it the rainbow bright <laughs> or Crayola crayon kind of effect. If you start getting really crazy with your color designs, uh, it can hurt the eyes and kind of detract from your early gestures. But yeah. Um, back to the mini map here. So on the mini map, you want to have uh, your starting points or your spawn points, right? So spawn. You could also have uh, over here, I'm going to use uh, circles, uh, triangles, squares, like simple, very simple, two-dimensional primitives to designate. Maybe the triangles represent uh, checkpoints. All right, so check one, check two, right? And then maybe these end uh, rectangles could be the objective, right? The end of that particular part of, part of the level. Now, the beauty of games is they're nonlinear. You can make games as complex as you want, so perhaps if you sp have your original spawn point and you go through all the whole game and you unlock certain things and you've defeated the the bad guy or you know made the correct allies or you know gotten the uh, artifact and brought it back, maybe the original spawn point also becomes the true objective of the game. So we could kind of put that back as also the objective or end game on here. So your, your beginning can also be your end if you go through and traverse through your game. All right. So let's see about some of the different papers that we have here. So I have really cheap watercolor tablets. This is, uh, I think this was $4. And we had 30 pages in here of watercolors. Now with watercolor and Tombow pens, as great as you can pull these out when you're on the BART or on, at the park or on the bus, whatever, and you can actually go in and um, use your pens without having to pull out you know, a bunch of water and all that to do like watercolor inks, but you can get in here and you can kind of play with positive and negative space. So let's try a positive and negative space. So I'm using the negative space to kind of designate areas of rough terrain that maybe you can't really move through yet. Um, the latest Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, I think is a beautiful example of amazing level design mixed with uh, different real world movement types that have a kind of somewhat, somewhat more realistic uh, take on having a, a stamina bar to be able to climb and to hold your breath and to swim and fly and you know, freeze to death and things like that. So. Uh, different rhythms and patterns, so just kind of playing with uh, your gesture lines again, getting looser, holding it like this, I can kind of get a little bit more gesture with it, and you can fill in any of these hard spots. Your simulation boundary is another thing to consider, or the actual boundaries of your game world that you don't want the player to feel like a rat in a cage, but you also have to have boundaries within most games. There's almost no absolutes anymore, I'm just kind of sticking with what most games have. So if I'm filling this in, you might enter this segment of the level. And even Grand Theft Auto and the new Project Red uh, Cyberpunk, you know, which will probably be the biggest open game world to date, even those games have boundaries, right? You can't just have it uh, go on to infinity, unless it's like No Man's Sky procedural, and then you have usually pretty rotten uh, storytelling. <laughs> the procedural world like that. We're not there yet to make something like that that interesting. So that's with my dark 
uh, N35 Tombow. And then I can go back into my lighter ones. So yeah, that's, there's my entry point. When you're doing this gestural stuff, you don't have to label anything yet. But now, since it's on watercolor paper and these are water-based pens, I can now pull that darker color and I can blend it with my lighter gray colors. So if I wanted to do, say, oh, I don't know, like a swampy waterway through here. Let's see if I can get one a little bit lighter. It's handy. Yeah, here we go. There we go. So I think that one's just about dead, it looks like. Water pen. Here's my water pen. Okay. So these are great. You just throw a little water in it. I wouldn't put these in around any um, electronics uh, packets if you're traveling with your backpack, with your laptop, or whatnot. But you see, as soon as I hit this ink, it just pulls right up just like it was watercolor. And that's pretty freaking cool to play around with that and move that around the watercolor paper. So um, I highly recommend playing with uh, watercolor um, gouache. Tombow pens, just get a couple pens. They're not cheap, they're you know, four or five bucks, but um, this is a really fun way to come up with uh, level signs. Now I'm looking at this and just playing around, um, but I'm trying to think of um, you know, what shapes are gonna help maybe uh, signify something as uh, dangerous or uh, lead the player around. So you know, something has more uh, you know, spiky, you know, something, what makes something look dangerous, color and shape. Maybe it's got, you know, a whole root system hanging down. So right now it's kind of looking more like a side scroller -y game, side scroller ish. Insanely twisted side of Shadow Planet. Limbo, noir, you know, if you're doing black and whites. Now, if I finish this up and I like it, I can scan this into Unreal Engine and load it as a, as a, uh, height map for my landscape and I can get a top-down topological view of this so I might try that out on this one just to show you guys um, how fast it is to build these levels there we go and you just fill this with water and I think I've had the same two for 10 years now so they last they've lasted me a long time and if you need to you just squeeze the pen a little the water gets forced through the bristles there you go I got a little bead of water there and then I can bring that water on, I can really play around with this. There we go. And it dries nicely on your tablet, so you can get a smaller tablet, you don't have to get 8 by 10 you can get a smaller, you know, pocket size one. Just take with you so you could use it in the break room, wherever. If you're at the university or you're just out and about in the age of COVID, there we go. And now I'm starting to kind of get looser with this and having fun with it squeeze a little bit more water out again there it goes so um, this is a, a island wet wash or literally it's called an island wash where you like make a little island of water and then pull different pigments into that water and you kind of let it run around and so you know you wouldn't normally I think in most game programs they're not going to tell you to go use watercolors <laughs> for level design but since I, all the years I've been playing around with this I've learned to uh, or I've had the excitement and passion to learn as many art forms as I can. I found that watercolor and charcoal sticks and things like that actually are really fun to level design with. And now if I get really uh, washy like this, I'm gonna have to uh, let it dry a bit before I do too much more to it. I mean, so there's that, that limiting factor on there. But, so making the negative space as interesting as the positive space is what I like about this process. So I'm, I'm wetting this ink and this is all negative space. Now when I'm on Photoshop, when I scan this in, I can go in and um, invert any of this, right? And I can copy and paste and select this. But getting this kind of effect right away in Photoshop usually takes a bit more practice and is not as easy to do. And now I'm going to start uh, stringing together possible land masses of this. So maybe my white area in here might be um, open space and we get the, you know, kind of typical game sci-fi, like floating rock type of uh, structures in here, something like that. But as you can see right here, my primary path is probably going to be right here. And I'm leading the player through these different uh, topologies and then maybe the 
objective or the places to go can be open-ended, but you might give them like four or five options. Uh, two or threes, I think, uh, in the student project we're doing for semesters about the maximum you can do. And I always recommend do one good level, document it well, explore, get your game mechanics working before you bother going two and three levels that are all half-baked and that don't quite work. I think you're better off showing off um, if you're going to complete a digital level, try and get a one good one before, and then if you get that one good one working, then you have a toolkit of uh, blueprints and model kits to um, make more levels, and almost never do teams have time to go make those extra levels, at least not to make them really worthwhile. Okay, so I was talking a lot during that, and I could have uh, taken, torn this out and made some other things, but having a little fun there um what you can also look at this is uh say what do you need to build your level with so let's identify uh, model kits so from this we need a model kit and hopefully this is drying enough you can see it's buckling a little bit and if i had an air dryer i could just hit this and it would be dry within a few minutes so your model kits and your uh, tiling textures your tileable textures we now have uh, model kits available like crazy and unreal engine and, and unity and all this and the model kits are appealing now the model kits are how these game companies are still making money off of all the small indie developers and schools um but they're cool they have you know there's some good model kits but it's nice if you know the basics of maya and uh if you like 3d modeling at all minecraft things like that you can usually identify uh and, and build your own basic model so i would do macro structures so macro structures would be um architecture right so big buildings so I could go in here and I could do I'll just do some kind of like organic building structures something like that All right and then maybe uh, you have some then you have large and medium small and you could do micro structures right and then for tileable textures, what are the main surfaces that cover your world? So usually that's going to entail uh, walls, <clears throat> floors, um, ceilings or roofs, and outside of that, uh, that again, that would be for architecture. Then you're going to have uh, your organic sets, right? So then the model kits over here for um, the architecture, the other large ones you might have would be like maybe uh, roads, um, walls, uh, maybe um, vehicles, etc. A medium you might have, you know, um, creatures. I guess that's not with an architecture, but um, you'd have uh, furniture, uh, lighting fixtures, etc. Okay, now with the tileable textures outside of architecture, you'd have uh, let's do the organics in the middle. So for organics, you might have uh, like you know large mountainous rocky structures, right? Here's your large rocks, mountains, cliffs. Then you have your larger ones, which might have some boulders, right? And for the medium ones, you might have you know your rocks, pebbles, down to the tinier ones, right? Tileable texture, same things. You'd have like big cliff face textures that you're going to put in, and these will tile, and you can blend these tiles together. And then you'd have uh, your smaller tileable textures that might be your uh, paved roads or uh, sandy beaches, right? Things like that. And then the smallest ones, of course, you'd have, you know, like cracks, m uh, cracked mud, things like that. So do sand and dirt and mud, right? 
So if you can come up with a kit after you're exploring these, maybe each one of these drawings you do, list out what your model kits would be. Right? So you should be able to come up with, I'd say, 10 to 15 models that you would need to rough in your level. We're talking about white boxing. And on the textures, I think, you know, just six to eight tileable textures will do it. Now you have mega scans, right? Which uh, I believe Epic purchased. Now mega scans is amazing, but you're dealing with gigabytes of data. And even the big teams at AAA Studios and within Epic, they're having a hard time pushing these project files back and forth uh, with teams, you know, eight, 10, 20, you know, we're talking getting 8,000, uh, or excuse me, yeah, 8K textures and things like that. So what I'm presenting here is an idea to quickly rough in your levels, um, pick out some model kits you would need, pick out some tileable textures you would need, and build it and get it done in a day, right? So if I'm looking at this uh, a little bit more, maybe uh, we'll do, you know, like the giant dead gods world, you know, the mountains here. I'm cheating a little bit. I have some of my favorite uh, drawings up in front of me. It was uh, Tony Dieterlisi, who did Planescape for second edition Dungeons and Dragons. He also did the Spiderwet Chronicles. You know, inside of there might be, you know, the cave of the ancient dead god, and the windswept plains, and you know, maybe there's some. Maybe you have to travel to uh, the other world, to the hells or the abyss to retrieve an artifact. You know, whatever your mission is. John Carpenter of Mars, Chronicles of Riddick. Of course, I'm presenting my biases for stuff I like. I'm sure you have uh, anime, you have, there's so much to draw from for all this stuff. So there's a little side, more side view-ish. So this would be, uh, you could do like an overland map or a world map as well. And again, very gestural. And then the positive negative space, I go back in here with say a gray tone and I just kind of fill this in a little bit and uh, a lot of times if you just shade a, a couple value tones is enough to separate things on the page. And if you're wanting the player to travel through, I'm going to do this uh, on the computer in Photoshop, then I can take a different color or my pen, but I would typically do this in Photoshop because I can always just do as many layers as I want. And I would do some sort of, uh, you know, again, starting point. Makes it a little bit bigger on camera. There we go. And, and then another dot here. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe get up to the peak up here. Maybe there's another entrance up there. Of course, at the entry to the giant dead god skull cave. You know, Shadow of the Colossus God of War style. And maybe there's one right inside the lower left eye socket if you have the the right magic item to go. There we go. And you can literally put a dot trail here. Maybe a path that you present to the player using your affordances. That is things within the game that are have expected outcomes, like uh, that are going to trigger, you know, sign postages. You know, the uh, the care. Maybe you have the caravan of creatures traveling through. You know, are they enemies or are they hostile or are they friendly? Or are they neutral? Does it depend on how uh, Wasteland is an amazing game? That was uh, the, one of the first <clears throat> games that uh, remembered what you did at different points in the game and then um, would affect the game world when you went back and revisited would have different things happening. Okay, so that's a pretty good start, I think so far. Um, this particular map here I'm going to scan. Um, we went through a couple different ways to do these. Um, I guess before I finish I would do want to get some graph paper at least since I was talking about that. And you could fill in the graph paper and so on the scrap of graph paper I'm just going to kind of fill in a typical dungeon with uh, solid colors and so I'm kind of staying within the grid lines a little bit.